Good evening, everyone. Welcome down to Friday Night Meditation. <coughs> I'm going to be reading a few announcements tonight. So on Monday, the 26th, which is a public holiday, the reception and library will be open for sales only. Early Buddhism workshop series by Ajahn Brahmali and Venerable Sa Sanyo on Right Samadhi is on Saturday, the 26th of November, the 3rd and 10th of December. Registration will open at the end of October. Our new Buddhist Q&A sessions with Gita continue here tomorrow from 2 to 3 p.m. Kusala Hermitage End of Ren's Retreat Ceremony will be held here at Dhammaloka on Sunday the 2nd of October from 10.30 a.m. All are welcome. Ajahn Brahm will be travelling to Albany, Denmark and Walpole from the 30th of September to the 3rd of October giving Dharma talks at each location. Please visit our website for more details. Bookings are opened for the Be Quiet group, Being a Friend to Yourself Youth Retreat with Ajahn Santuti on Friday the 2nd to Sunday the 4th of December at Jana Grove. Please email bequiet at bswa.org for bookings and inquiries. Our introduction to meditation classes will return to being held in, in the side shrine room as of the 1st of October. Volume 2 of the Ajahn Brahm sticker packs is now out, so please visit our websites. Uh, volunteer gardening coordinator needed. If you'd like to help take care of Damaloka Gardens, please contact Bill, who is at the back standing and waving his hand, and please email at events at bswa.org. Damaloka Building Fund is now an option for tax-deductible donations to support BSWA. And lastly, tonight's guest speaker is Matt Gibson, and he'll be giving a talk titled Using Your Body and Mind to Find Joy in the Present. But before we start our talk, we'll start with a half an hour guided meditation. So please get comfortable, close down your eyes, and when the talk is um, just about ready, I'll come introduce Matt. Matt's actually guiding the meditation. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. There we go. How's that? Can you hear me now? Wonderful. So if you'd like to get in the most comfortable position that you can find at the moment, um, this is your chance. If you need to run off and get a cushion, take the opportunity now. And to begin with, we're just going to close our eyes nicely and gently. We're not trying to force our eyes closed. Just nice and relaxed, close them. And in the beginning of any meditation, I like to take a sort of a snapshot of how I'm feeling right now. After all, this is the end of the day and we're carrying our stresses and our emotions and our activities of the day with us into this meditation. So a good technique for this is just to simply ask yourself, how do I feel right now? And what this does, it may sound simple, but what this does is actually engages your mindfulness onto the task at hand, and you'll find that you get an answer. It might not be words, it might just be in feelings in your body how am I feeling right now? And you might find that your back may be a bit tense or sore, or like me at the moment, a bit of a sniffle. Or you might find that your shoulders feel a bit heavy, or your legs may be sore or aching. 
So by asking your body, how does it feel right now? You get a pretty good answer and a good starting point for your meditation. And what we do is when we find something that is presenting as tired, as tense, as painful, as irritating, we then take a moment to try and relax that part of our body as best we can. And how you do this depends on you. It is different for many people. You can imagine your muscles as strings in that particular part of your body. And you can just imagine those strings, both of the ends of the strings coming together and the tension disappearing. Or if you're more experienced, you can use the feeling of your breathing as it comes in and as it goes out with that part of your body in mind, sort of breathing through that part of the body. A lot of the time, these parts of our bodies just want some attention. They just want, it's five minutes of care. And actually breathing into that part of your body is a great way of showing kindness to that part of your body, of giving it some energy back. It could be your feet, for example, if you've been on your feet all day and they are tired and sore and they've been working very hard for you, this is now your time to give back to your feet. It sounds a bit strange, but it works. So I like to start with the places that are the most or the loudest and deal with those parts of your body first and just do what you can to relax those parts. Really find a really comfy part of the seat or the floor and try not to fiddle too much and really focus on what is painful, what is sore what is irritating. And you find that if you're doing this correctly, you're not sort of going off into fantasies or planning or thoughts of anything other than the meditation you're doing right now. It's the most important thing. What is happening right now? If you ever get lost in your meditation practice, just asking yourself, what am I aware of, can really help. If you're one of the lucky people that don't have any ailments or problems or pains in the body, you can always start with your feet or start at your head. Just bring your mindfulness gently to that part of your body. And for example, if you're bringing your mindfulness to your head, make that part of your body your full awareness. So there's no room for thinking about anything else. How does the top of your head feel? Is it cold? Is it warm? Are you frowning? Bring all of your attention to that part of your body and see how it feels. And if it feels okay, then we move down to the next part of our head. You can move down to your eyebrows and your eyes. What are your eyes doing right now? Are they still moving around? Are you locking your eyebrows together with stress from your day? See what you can do yourself to relax that part of your body. Really let them be at ease. And then we can move down to our mouths. 
even our ears, and then taking the head as a whole. How does your head feel right now? Are you leaning one way too far? To the side or to the front or to the back? Does your head feel balanced on your shoulders? And this is important because if you're not sitting correctly over a long period of time, you'll be causing more aches. So if you need to shuffle or move, please do. And something I like to do is just to move my head just a little bit, forward and back, left and right. Just a little bit, just to see if it feels okay where it is. Once we feel like our head is nicely balanced and there's not too much tension, it's not aching too much, and we've done all that we can do, we move down to our neck and our shoulders. We often carry a lot of our stress in our neck and our shoulders. And many times you'll find you sit there in meditation and your shoulders slowly rise up just remind yourself to slowly bring them back down. Just let them hang there. And if you're ever not sure, you can always ask, how do my shoulders feel? You're becoming too distracted with thoughts of yesterday or tomorrow or what you're doing later, planning, thinking. Ask yourself, what are my shoulders doing? Bring your awareness, your mindfulness to the task. And if your shoulders are feeling good, you'll know. You know yourself what feels tense and what doesn't. And you know that when something is tense and you allow it to relax, there is a good feeling there that happens when you let it relax. And this is important for later on. From your shoulders, you can go to your arms, either individually or together and just see what you're doing with your arms. Are you tensing them up? Are you fidgeting with your fingers? Are you holding any stress in your hands at all? And if you are, how can you make them feel more at ease, more at peace, more comfortable, more relaxed? Just allowing our hands just to rest in our laps. Nothing for them to do, nothing for them to hold. Just let them rest there and do nothing. And then we can pay attention to our chest. Our breathing is a good indicator of how stressed we are, how relaxed we are. And often in the beginning, your breathing may be fast, it may be shallow. Can you notice what kind of breathing you are doing right now? How does it feel to breathe that way? Are you sitting up nice and straight so that you're not putting any pressure on your lungs? You're not slumping forward too much in your chair? How does your breathing feel right now? 
How does your breathing feel if you change it? If you breathe in and out a little deeper, a little slower. Breathe in and out with a bit more patience. Are you fighting the rhythm of your breathing? If you're feeling anxious or tired. If you're sitting correctly, you can actually let your breathing find its own rhythm, its own pace. The important thing is to pay attention to how is it feeling right now. Everything we're doing is about right now. In here, in this room, in this body, in this mind. We're not concerned about the cars outside or the person next to us. Bringing all of our mindfulness to our body. Not expecting much. Just seeing what happens. Just happy to be here. Giving this kindness, this care to your body and to your mind. It's very important. I like to sit with my breath for a few minutes. So if you like to just keep paying attention to your breathing, noticing how does it feel and if, is there anything that you can do to make your f breathing feel a bit more relaxed, a bit more comfortable. Just keep paying attention to your breath and just make small changes. Breathe in a little deeper, see how it feels. Breathe out a little deeper and see how it feels. If you feel like your breathing has started to calm down and it does start to feel a bit more peaceful, a bit more relaxing, then we move on to our stomach, our abdomen, our waist. A good time just to make sure you're sitting correctly still and you're not putting too much strain on your back or the sides.
just taking note of how these parts of our body feels. And if you think you can do something about it, then please do. Spend a little bit of time with your back, especially if you're sitting on the floor. You don't want to be straining your back muscles too much. So just make little tiny movements, forward, back, left and right. Try and sit up a little straighter and see how that feels. If it's better, and that's good. We just want to sit in a balanced way so that we can allow our body the maximum chance of finding some relaxation and some peace. If you do have back pain, you can imagine, like I said in the beginning, the, the strands in the muscles of your back relaxing. You just imagine how that would feel if the strands in your muscles were to pull in the opposite direction to what it's doing now and was actually relaxing those strands. How nice that would feel. Or you can focus on the mental part of that sensation and you can imagine the sensation diminishing into a point or you take the sensation and you imagine it expanding so much so much that it goes really thin and is not as bad as it was there are all different ways and again, you can send your breathing to that part of your body, breathing through your back, breathing through those muscles. When we breathe, our whole body moves, including our back. There's a relationship there. See if you can notice it. if you're happy and content of where you are at the moment with your body then we continue down our legs to our feet also noticing how we're sitting on the chair just making sure that we're not having to move around too much The idea is to be able to leave our body alone after we've spent some time with it. I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes and what I'd like you to do is Go through your body very slowly, very kindly, very gently, with a lot of patience, whichever way, from top to bottom, bottom to top. And just take this time to get to know your body and how it feels right now. And if you get lost or distracted, just remember to ask, what am I aware of? How does my body feel?
like you to take a moment like we did in the beginning and just take a snapshot right now of how different you feel after learning to relax these different parts of your body how do you feel right now compared to the beginning even if you just feel a tiny little bit more relaxed and that is good how does my body feel does my body still feel very tired do I still have the same amount of pain in my body do I feel more relaxed more at ease even mentally does your mind feel like it has calmed like your thoughts have stopped racing so much So I'll ring the bell very soon. I don't want you to anticipate when the bell will ring. I just want you to enjoy these last few seconds of the meditation. Just happy to be here, comfortable, relaxed, giving our body and our mind the care it needs and deserves. Such a wonderful thing. And at the end of the third ring, just very slowly, very gently, open your eyes. And that will be the end. Thank you, Matt, for the beautiful, grounding, nurturing meditation. Um, so I'll be introducing Matt tonight. I don't know much, much about Matt, but all I can say, he's practically old furniture here. He's been here for about 12 years, and without further ado, he'll be giving a talk about using your body and mind to find the joy in the present moment. So over to you, Matt. Mm, thank you very much. <laughs> 
So I hope you all enjoyed that meditation. Might be a bit different, or might be the same to what you're used to doing. Um, and please excuse my sort of uh, voice tonight. <laughs> it's been a very tiring week. Um, and so, yeah, I've been practicing meditation for the better part of 12 years. Some of you know who I am and know my story. Uh, so for those of you who don't, I'll just quickly go over that. Um, I know just so you know a bit about me, I suppose. Um, about 12, 13 years ago, uh, I was very sick. And most people, I'd say a lot of people, come to meditation when they become sick. And I was one of those people. Um, I was told that I had two years to live and I was very skinny, uh, very underweight, very malnourished. And the doctors had no idea what was going on. Um, and so I thought, okay, this is a bit of a scary situation to find myself in. Uh, you know, being quite young and coming to what I thought would be sort of the end of my life. And I wanted to learn how to come to terms with that and also how to come to terms with the pain that I was in. Uh, because I was in excruciating amounts of pain and uh, the painkillers and medication that I was on was making me worse, making me very sick. Um, I was having seizures because of them, so I was just not in a very good way. And so I thought, okay, uh, maybe I'll learn meditation. I heard there's good benefits of learning uh, how to meditate properly. And that's when I went and first met Ajahn Brahm. Um, at the monastery and I learned from him just like many of you guys here probably have and so after a while six months to a year of uh, practicing meditation and really learning about my body and learning about the pain that I was in um, I found that I was getting better it was quite strange how you can use meditation in a way like that um, you're not just doing it to sort of feel relaxed when you've really got a, um, a reason to meditate, you meditate quite well. Um, and so that was a very uh, serious reason. <laughs> and in that time, I learned quite a lot, a lot about myself, a lot about how uh, the body and the mind work together, um, how I was creating a lot of stress and, and pain, making the pain worse by stressing about the situation I was in. It's just a multi-layered sort of cake of suffering, I call it. Um, so it's a really good teacher. If you ever really want to get deep into your practice, really look into what is actually causing you uh, that irritation, that sort of negative uh, push for things to be other than the way they are. Um, I had my whole life ahead of me well, I still do, <laughs> but back then, uh, you know, I was told I had two years to live and it was just um, a very stressful, very heavy period to be in and I know that there's a lot of people out there who are in a very similar situation. Um, so I do hope that what I do talk about um, helps any of you guys in that situation. Um, I think that's all I would say about myself. There's nothing really more interesting. <laughs> um, but what I do want to talk about is how when we're doing meditation, when we're really paying attention, we're really practicing hard uh, and we really want to find out how all of this works. I struggled a lot in the beginning because I thought you had to make your mind quiet. I thought you had to sit here and you had to be as still and as quiet and as uh, non-interfering as you can so that, you know, peace would, you know, I was controlling my meditation. And of course that doesn't work because if you want to be peaceful, you won't find peace. That's just how it works. If you want to be peaceful, well, peace is what's there when you're no longer uh, experiencing any pain or suffering. It's just the inverse of that. Peace isn't actually something that you can grab and hold on to and manufacture yourself in your mind. It has to be done the right way. And the way that I learned over the years is uh, with your body, so the meditation that we just did, 
you may have noticed that when you do go through those different parts of your body and for example say your shoulders you feel your shoulders and they're so tense and they're so tight from the day that you've just had and you finally get to that part of your body and then you just oh you relax them just i can't help but make that sound it just feels so good just to let them drop down and it's that feeling um that you can sort of cultivate in the meditation there's these little parts of that feeling around your body and your job is to connect all those good parts those good relaxing um, feeling um, parts of your body and you use them as a way of like overall feeling good in the present moment if that makes sense sometimes i'm not the best at describing things um, but you you can take those parts, those little bits of peace, those little bits of um, relaxation. Uh, even if you're someone that practices kindness to your body and you know that giving kindness to that sore, painful or sick part of yourself feels really good because it's kind, it's caring. Um, and then that makes you feel good as a person. So in your mind, there's joy that comes up. And that's sort of when I was first starting out in meditation, it took me a long time to learn this. So I was trying to really control everything and then I sort of went to a, a, a period of time where I was noticing this joy that was coming up in my mind. And the most amazing thing is when you have that, even if it's just a little bit, that joy helps you to concentrate. That concentration is no longer this, um, like this effort. It's like when you ride a bike. When you first learn to ride a bike, you know, you've really got to concentrate not to fall off. It's a real effort. The concentration feels like forced but when you get the hang of it and then you start actually having fun riding your bike you don't think about it it's like second nature and it's the same thing in meditation um, you get to that point where you, you can start cultivating these feelings of of gladness and goodness and um, relaxation and it all sort of comes together and you're you don't have to actually concentrate as hard meditation becomes very easy it stops being um, forced. It stops um, feeling like you're trying to control the outcome. And you actually can learn how to let go a lot easier and let the meditation happen. And so for me, it took me here long because I'm a, I'm a control freak. I don't mind. I don't mind admitting that. Uh, it did take me a long time to learn how to do that and how to let go so that your meditation does happen. If you've ever had a time when you're practicing meditation and you feel like it just, it just doesn't feel right or you'd rather be interested um, doing something else, that's why you haven't learnt yet how to bring that joy up in your mind, how to make it an exciting and fun uh, thing for your mind to be doing. Your mind will it'll pick the most exciting thing around. If it's that car that's just gone down the street, and you're bored in your meditation practice, you'll listen to that car go down the street. And it's not exciting. <laughs> it's not exciting at all. But your mind will go out to that because it's not happy where it is. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that your body is irritating. It's, um, there's all this sensory data coming in all the time. And so instead of dealing with that, it would rather listen to that car that's gone down the street. And... So for that, that's probably one of the biggest things that I like to teach um, when I'm talking about meditation is learning ways, and it's different for everybody, learning ways of bringing up that joy, that happiness in your mind um, by starting off with your body. Uh, it's much easier with your body first to learn these things and then going on to the mind later. Um, you're more likely to stick with the meditation object. It can be breathing it can be even walking meditation um, it can be loving kindness meditation any of the meditations if your mind is not happy where it is it'll find some random thing outside to listen to it'll find some random fantasy to go down for an hour you could be sitting there for an hour having this whatever fantasy about anything who knows what or you could be planning your holiday you're taking in two years time or you could be thinking about what are you going to have for dinner when you come home. There's all these things that come up in your mind except for the one thing that you're meant to be doing, which is paying attention to your body. 
Um, what else was I going to say? I was going to talk about it in the meditation, but that half an hour actually went really fast. Um, what we generally like to do is to go through the body first, really relax the body as much as we can. And it can be a double-edged sword. You can chase those feelings in your body that are irritating you around and around and around in circles. Um, you have to learn how to find a point at which to say, there's nothing more I can do for my back or my leg or whatever, and then move on to the next part of your body. One of the biggest difficulties I've had in my practice, because I've got really bad back problems, um, is that when your body and your mind starts to calm down, you become a lot more sensitive to what's happening. You become a lot more sensitive to your body. All, all of a sudden, the tiny itch is just like amplified and it's just like... <laughs> um, so with my back and my back pain, I've had many times where I've sat there and I've gone through my body just like we did and the pain was just amplified. It was 10 times... Um, I was actually sitting in the meditation hall at Jana Grove in tears because the pain was just so intense. But the thing was, was I was still trying to control the pain. I was still trying to um, force an outcome rather than just let things happen, um, if that makes sense. So it can be a double-edged sword. If you do chase that fit those sensations too much, you have to learn when to say, there's nothing more I can do. Um, if you've got a sore knee, if you've relaxed it, you've moved into a good enough position, you've tried sitting in a chair, you've tried laying down on the floor, there's nothing else you can do, then the next thing you do is just leave it alone. Let it hurt. Our body likes to call a bluff. And this was something else I learned in the beginning when I was learning meditation. Uh, you're either listening for a clock or you're trying to guess how long it's been, um, or you're... Um, I've lost my train of thought because I looked at the clock. <laughs> See what I mean? Distracted straight away. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. I'm so tired. I said double-edged sword. <laughs> Let's go, just go back. Amplified, that's right. Um, yeah, so you learn to leave things alone. Thank you. You learn how to leave your body alone at that point. There's nothing else you can do for it. Um, and that's a really hard lesson to learn, especially if you're in pain, especially if you've been sitting there for that half an hour and your body's starting to ache and you, you really feel that sensation to start moving. Uh, you sort of really want to get up and walk around. Sometimes the best thing to do in that situation is actually to sit there and call your body's bluff. Go, I'm just going to sit for another, well, what you might think is five more minutes. Just see how it goes. Another five minutes or two minutes. Whatever you think you can, you can muster. Obviously, if you're in a lot of pain, don't do that because you'll cause yourself more damage. Just leave it. Um, but if it's just a general ache and pain in your body, then give it a go. Try and just sit there and just sort of understand that it's okay to be feeling the way that you're feeling. Uh, the pain, it's fine. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and if you call the bluff, sometimes the most amazing thing happens is that your body becomes so peaceful, so calm, without you even trying. Uh, there's just no more irritation there. It's just, it's just at ease. And you can leave it alone. Um, and that was something I wanted to talk about in the meditation because we go through everything, we want to be able to get to that point where our body is no longer irritating us. Uh, there is no longer any more pain there. The thing about the, the body and the mind is, if there's nothing moving, you can't perceive it. If you leave the pain alone and you stop sending your mind to that part of your body where that pain is there, um, and it learns right, this isn't very interesting, I'll just start looking over somewhere else. That sensation actually disappears um, and you're not in pain anymore. It's really quite bizarre. Uh, and it, it's all, you've done that. You've learnt something there, something really important um, of how to let things go, how to leave things alone. And it's just an amazing thing. Um, 
how I gave that example earlier of me sitting in the hall at Jana Grove in tears. That's where I learned that. I learned that, okay, it's fine to be in pain. Um, it's okay to be in this condition, sitting here in this pain. There's nothing wrong with that. And I allowed it to be the way it was. Um, and then my body was just so light, so peaceful, so relaxed after that because I wasn't actually... Um, stirring the pot so to speak I wasn't meddling in the practice like you know we like to do we like to control it and then that happiness that sort of gladness that uh, that good feeling that you get in your body that that is when your concentration really will uh, consolidate it will really come together um, your mindfulness throughout the day is like a sheepdog all right in the sheep, the sheepdog's job is to round up all the sheep. There could be a sheep in that corner of the paddock. There could be a sheep over there. And as soon as the dog goes to that one, this one here runs that way. And that's what your mind is like. And when we sit in meditation, uh, our mindfulness is that sheepdog. And what we're doing is we're bringing, we're making our mind full again, not mind part of well, part meditation. Uh, sorry, part uh, um, awareness over there. We're bringing it all together into this one big sort of. Uh, Super awareness, I like to call it. It just sounds cool. And um, you find that you're not sort of spread thin anymore. Your, your mindfulness is all brought together on the task at hand. It's not interested in anything else. And meditation becomes easy, especially when your body is relaxed and you're, you're not having that, um, that irritation there anymore. Your mind will concentrate the most when it is uh, content. That was the word I was looking for, content. If you can find contentment in your practice, even when things are going wrong, even when you are in pain, if you can find contentment in those situations and let the meditation happen, it's amazing. It really is. But how many of us can say that we can do that? <laughs> We'd rather control it and, oh, I want peace. So I've been working hard all day. Oh, I want to be nice and relaxed right now. And then you sit there for half an hour and nothing happens and you get frustrated and all oh, this meditation business isn't for me. And then you give up. And it's like the old analogy of um, when you get paid from work. You don't get paid every day when you go to work. Every day is not payday. It's only at the end of the week or the fortnight where all of your effort comes together and you go, ah, oh, i got money now, I've got paid. That's all worth it. All the effort I've put in is now worth it. Same with meditation. You could sit there for a week um, putting effort in and you might not think that you're making progress in your meditation practice but you actually are the bad times in your meditation where you've had the most difficulty concentrating the most di difficulty staying motivated the most difficulty having to um, stay with your concentration they're actually the times that you learn the most I find uh, because there's something to be learnt there. And that's where meditation is really, um, really special in that regard. Because it's not all about sitting here for half an hour, just trying to be peaceful. It's actually about trying to learn about you, about your body, about your mind. Um, that's what the Buddha said. You have this mind, you have this body. That is all you need to practice. You don't need anything special. Um, you don't need nothing else, just your body and your mind and the, uh, the inspiration to actually sit there and give it a good go. So next time you do sit, see if you can go through your body the way we did tonight. See if you can take note of all these different little tiny moments of, um, of peace that you can find. These little tiny moments where you do actually, you actually are able to relax. And that feeling of relaxation and you're aware of it and you go, oh, that feels nice. See if you can cultivate those um, and then bring them all together at the end. And you get very good at it. And that's, that's practice. You get good at doing that. And then the next stage from there is learning how to leave the body behind. Um, it wasn't something I was really planning on talking about tonight, but I will, I don't mind. Um, if you leave your body alone long enough when you practice and you sit there, 
it disappears, like I said before. You're not, if there's nothing moving, there's nothing irritating, there's nothing for your mind to make contact with, there's nothing there. Someone's nice and relaxed. <laughs> That's good. Or I'm boring. <laughs> um, and so you, you get to that point where uh, your body is nice and relaxed and light and it feels good. That's really nice. Normally at that point, um, we, we let that happen. And this was another thing that took me a while to learn was, so with your body, you have the five senses, right? Sight, smell, taste, touch, the other one. Um, and we're constantly always aware of these things, these five doors where things you know, we're aware of. And during our day-to-day life, we are always sending our mind out through these five doors. We're always sort of looking for what is a pleasurable thing through those five doors for us to make contact with. Meditation is where we learn to go the opposite way. Um, we learn to uh, not look at... I mean, you're sitting there with your eyes closed. Unless you're doing walking meditation, you should have your eyes open. Um, you have your eyes closed. There's nothing for your eyes to look at anymore. So what happens is, after a while of your eyes moving around, trying to find something to look at, they actually stop. And when that first happens, it can feel a bit weird. Your eyes are not moving anymore. But it's actually also very peaceful because there's nothing... There's no energy expending there. There's nothing you need to do. And the same with feeling. Feeling, and that's where your body comes into it. You relax your body to the point where um, there's, no, there's no point in sending your mind out to your body anymore. You've spent the time relaxing it, taking care for it, um, giving it the attention it needs. That's when you leave it alone. You don't worry about that door of the feeling of your body anymore. You leave it alone body disappears and you go through all the five senses like that and what happens when all those five senses disappear you're left with just the mind and that's sort of the springboard the um the turning point of going from practicing meditation to getting into like the very like the more deeper states that can be for another talk um the point i'm trying to make is you guys anyone is able to practice in this way to get to that point. You are able to learn these uh, different relationships between your body, the five senses, and your mind, how they all come together. Um, and finding that joy and that happiness in your meditation is like the glue that's going to bring all this together and hold it together. If you don't have that, then it's going to fall. Excuse me. It's going to fall apart every time, and you'll be like, "Well, why?" That's um. So that's the journey that you have to be on. You have to look at, well, why isn't this not working the way people are saying it should? Um, and it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that, um, I mean, when I first started practicing meditation, I was very ignorant. You know, I, was, I didn't know any better. And so the journey is learning uh, insight. Okay, if I learn how to breathe in this way and it relaxes... Um, and it feels better just by breathing a bit more deeper, a bit longer, and that feels good, then you go, aha, okay, there's something to this. And then so you go through all the different parts of your body and you learn, okay, how can I learn, how can I learn to, um, say, like relax my back a bit better? Because some people have difficulty with this. They, they don't understand what it means to relax that part of the body um, it's just so different for everybody. You could use your breathing or you could imagine, like I said, like having strings being relaxed the opposite way and how that might feel. Um, or you have that feeling, like bringing that feeling into a point in your mind. Some people that works. For other people, it's grabbing that feeling and expanding it. And then you're sort of expanding it so much it goes thin, as I like to think of it. It goes so thin and it doesn't hurt so much. Uh, there's all different techniques that you can learn when it comes to relaxing your own body. Uh, one of the best ones is kindness, learning how to be kind to your body, learning how to be patient with your body, um, especially if you're somebody who's in pain, learning that being in pain or, or being sick is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's just the nature of your body. You can't change that. Um, and it's like a big burden is lifted off you. And when that burden's gone, you feel good. And then when you feel good, you can concentrate better. And when you can concentrate better, you can meditate better. And it's just this like domino effect that you go through. Now, I have not talked about sort of daily life. That, that's a big part of meditation, actually, um, is sort of the day that you've just had and how you bring that into your practice. So many times people have said to me that they've gone to meditate one day and all they could think about is the person that either they've yelled at or the person that's yelled at them. Um, and they sit there for half an hour and that's all they think about. And then, of course, they're not finding any peace. So the way that you uh, go about your daily life is hugely important when it comes to meditation practice. It's, I mean, it's just logical, really. Um, so that's a, an important thing to think about uh, when you sit. And even on the opposite side of that, if you've done something for somebody today, something kind, um, something generous, um, something you know, something good, then actually it's a really good time when you meditate is to bring those feelings and to remind yourself um, that you've done something good for somebody that day. It's not being selfish. You're, you're more than entitled to remember the good things you've done for people. Um, and it's just a really good way of bringing that joy and happiness into your mind so you can actually concentrate better, so you can meditate better. It's, it's all the same. Um, I don't know if I want to say much else about that. Where is... How long do I have to talk for? <laughs> oh, don't say that. <laughs> Okay. Plenty of time. <laughs> um, all right, I'll just say a couple more things and then we'll go to question time because I don't want to bore you too much. Uh, the other thing to pay attention to is being in the present moment. I mean, you guys have heard this hundreds of times from other teachers, but it is probably one of the most important parts of um, learning and practicing meditation. And I'm not just saying be aware of the present moment when you meditate. For me, when I started out, I had huge problems learning uh, concentration. And um, learning how to stay in the present moment, I mean, for, for most people, I would assume, I don't know, is quite difficult. And a good way to practice being mindful and being present is to practice this throughout your day. Um, the way I normally do this is I actually, if I'm walking somewhere, I'll, remo like, I'll say to myself, um, okay, I'm walking over there and, and I'll take my note of any sort of other things that I'm thinking of at the time. And the point is to just walk to that point. All right, so if I was walking to the other room over there, I would make it my um, sort of mission just to simply just to walk don't need to think about what I'm doing on the way over. Don't need to think about what I'm going to do when I get there. All I'm going to do is get there and just walk. Um, don't know if anyone here has actually practiced walking meditation, but it's really good throughout the day. Um, writing things. If you are at work and you have to write things, concentrating on your writing and making it nice and neat and being patient is actually a good way of being mindful. Um, and so there's all these different sort of ways that you can strengthen your mindfulness through the day so that when it comes time to actually sit down and meditate and practice, it's not like this huge um, shock to your mind. That, oh, all of a sudden I've got to be mindful. Um, if you've been practicing it throughout your whole day, it's really not that hard for another half an hour. Um, so that's, that's how I learned and that's how I practiced was that every moment of my day from when I got up to when I went to bed, was an opportunity to practice mindfulness and that really helped a lot with my uh with my meditation and then in the meditation itself uh, i'm sure i don't have to go over it you probably heard it a million times it's just being aware of what is happening right now if you get distracted ask yourself like i said before what is going on what am i aware of 
what am I meant to be doing right now? Because if you're not being mindful, you might, you're crazy. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what you're thinking about. Anything could be going on. You wouldn't even know about it. So you've got to learn to be mindful um, and be uh, in the present moment. Even with your breathing, if you get to a point in your meditation practice where your, uh, your body feels really good, it's really relaxed and calm, and then um, you're focusing on your breathing, you can actually go into the present moment so much that it's not just a beginning, a middle, and an end to each in-breath and out-breath, you're actually noticing the pause in between these breaths. And as you're breathing, if you were to try this right now, you wouldn't be able to keep up with it because it's just too much going on. But when your mind calms down and your concentration is more powerful, the in-breath, just the beginning of the in-breath, feels like it takes forever. And you can see the whole, everything that has to do with the in-breath and how it feels and where you're feeling it and all the qualities of the breath. And then you get to the middle of it and you go, oh, wow, then you're concentrating on that. And then the end of the in-breath. And then, you know, a very slow sort of long pause in between. And then the out-breath starts. And then the middle, and then the end, and then the pause. And you find that it's just this, it's not hard to do that when you're absorbed in the moment and you're fully present with what's happening. It's very much likened to... Um, uh, Oh, is it a Zen thing? I don't know. Sort of, um, a yoga people would know this. It's uh, when you're in the in the like a state of flow, and things are effortless, um, and you're able to just uh, be with what's happening without trying. It's like that. So, like, when you, if you really enjoy, uh, what's a sport? If you really enjoy tennis, for example, if you're really in the present moment you can see that ball coming from a mile away and it takes forever to get to you. And then you're being aware of your body and how you're moving your hand and the racket. You're aware of the air around you. You're aware of everything as it's happening in the moment. It's not just the ball coming and you hitting it. It's like this whole uh, long drawn out thing where you're aware of the whole thing and it's amazing. Um, and it only happens when you're content. So that's the key is when you're practicing meditation learn how to find contentment, learn how to be um, happy in the moment, learn to be patient, learn to let things happen, don't try to control too much. It sounds like I'm telling you all what to do. Um, and just be happy. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll end the talk there because I'm quite tired. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free. I'll try to answer them as best I can. <clears throat> you've definitely reminded me a few things and like you've listed it contentment letting go and I like your yogi your yoga reference as well yep. it's um what we call the eight limb flow to um, by Pantanjali uh, oh, yep. nice reminder where you mentioned if you can concentrate you can meditate and then maybe one day reach samadhi or enlightenment as they like yep. to say Yep. yep. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed your talk, so thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions on the floor? Yeah. What, after these ones? Yep, okay. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> um, thank you for tuning Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you for tonight. Yep. Um, very, very, um, very enjoy. Well, it was more than enjoyable. It was very, very um, heartwarming and um, very deep, very peaceful. Um, I just, I just want to say today is is actually Gratitude Day. Oh, it's, is it? it's National Gratitude Day, yep. and to me that is a part of contentment is yep. to actually be grateful for you know for for things for little things when they happen yeah. and little things in meditation the you know little awarenesses that actually end up becoming you know becoming very profound um, it took me you know a long time when I started meditation I I did it for a friend because she was 
sort of um, invited me and I really thought I'm wasting my time. It was so hopeless. <laughs> but, but now I have extremely beautiful meditation and deep bliss and I'm very grateful that I persevered. So I think perseverance is a big patience, perseverance and gratitude for me. Mm. Yep. Thank you for tonight. Definitely. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, those three things are very important. Hello. Oh, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, I understood very well what you said about you got a painful knee and just ignore it because... A few years ago, I had a very bad case of tinnitus ringing in my ears at night. All the time, I dreaded going to bed. Yeah. And one night, I, I just couldn't sleep, so I started walking around Lake Munga in the middle of the night, carrying a <laughs> lump of wood in case someone was there in the dark. And one night, it suddenly stopped. And I went back again when it happened the next night, and I found that... What was happening, when I was walking, I was looking at my feet, it was dark, and I wasn't thinking about the tinnitus. Mm. And this became a key to it, to the fact that I only notice it now if I think about it. But the question I wanted to ask you is, if you have a painful knee, I, I understand that, what if you had a bad day today and you've got a bad thought? What do you do? How do you not put your attention on that thought and what happened to you during the day. Is there a similar principle involved? Yeah. That's what I'd like to understand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you can practice in the same way by first uh, being kind to yourself, obviously, first and foremost. Um, when we have painful thoughts and experiences and emotions, we tend to, uh, our first sort of reaction to those things is to push them away. We, we want to get rid of them. Uh, we don't want to experience those things. Um, and so that sort of does make it a lot worse. One of the things that comes to mind is, you know, if somebody, for example, calls you a dog, you could spend the next three hours thinking about how that person called you a dog, or you can turn around and see if you've got a tail, and then you can be done with it. <laughs> um, it's more about learning that we create such stories around things in our heads. There's like this narrative that goes on, whether it's with our physical body, with thoughts and feelings or experiences outside. Um, it's this narrative. If we are mindful enough and we can pay attention to this narrative, we're no longer taken for a long ride with it, if that makes sense. We, we can sort of know that, okay, the more, I, more attention I give to this um, sort of event that happens, uh, the, the worse I'm going to feel about it. I have a choice where I can continue on with that. I can continue to proliferate around those things or I can learn that I can actually not worry about it. I can actually let it go and um, you can understand that right now, in this moment right now, that's taking away my peace and you just don't let it. So is present moment awareness the secret, is it? Because what happened to you happened earlier in the day. Yeah. Is that right? And so yeah. if you come to the present moment, it's not happening. Yeah, I guess, that's, is that? that's right. It's not <laughs> happening right now, is it? Yeah, yeah. so okay. you don't have to worry about it. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. Yep. Anybody else going once? No, nope, maybe. Hello, thank you so much for that um, conversation and the talk. My question, I think, kind of follows that in, in the sense of, I remember you mentioning something about sickness. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective in terms of, you know, coming to the present moment and accepting what is, how you navigate or how you would encourage people to navigate chronic illness, especially in a society where I guess we seek medical attention and then that can become our identity. Yeah. We become a sick person. I'm a sick person suffering from this or that. So how would you encourage someone? Um, or how, would, how have you, if you've experienced anything like that, navigated that? Um, yeah. So back when I was really sick a while ago, um, again, I found that you know, being 
in that situation, obviously not ideal. Um, and you do sort of tend to create your whole world around being sick um, because people see you that way. Um, or if you have an illness where it's not visible, people um, aren't quite as understanding because they can't see that you're sick. And that sort of sparks off a whole lot of anxiety in the fact that you know, you're trying to find how you fit in with things, how you function with things. Um, you've got this burden that you have to deal with that other people don't or you think that other people don't. And so it really does spin this whole um, web of negativity around it where, I mean, for me personally, it was very hard to get people to understand what I was going through and then that was making things worse. Um, and sort of then you sit there and you think about that and you build upon that and it just sort of goes out of, out of hand. Um, but for me personally, when I was dealing with that, the biggest thing that helped me was learning how to be kind to myself. I know you've heard it probably a million times, um, but really properly 100% accepting the fact that this is just your body right now it's just how it is it's the nature of your body i mean everyone's going to get old everyone's going to get sick and die some of us it just happens a bit earlier in life sometimes we actually do get better from it um, the truth is that we just don't know what's going to happen and i think that's probably the scariest thing about having a chronic illness is that this sort of big thing of uncertainty that hovers over us um and then that impacts everything else under it, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard because have been, having chronic illness is a very lonely thing. Uh, and you really do want people to understand what you're going through. But that in itself can be a hurtful thing because then you're expecting something that might not happen. Um, and so it can actually be quite hard, but you have to learn how to learn how to deal with this on your own and how to be strong for yourself during these times. Um, I mean, that you know, the time of your life where you want that help and support from other people, sometimes it's just not there. Sometimes you have to really practice some real, you know, um, compassion towards yourself and just say, it. I mean, for me personally, again, I just saw it as it was a normal thing. Like the Buddha taught, um, teaches, it's a normal thing to be sick, to get old and die. There's nothing special about it. Um, and if you can see it that way, it's a, it's a great help. It really is. So I hope that sort of helps answer your question a bit. <laughs> so what I understood is just accept and know that, I guess, this is a season that your body might be going through. Yeah, I mean, it sounds quite cold when it sort of comes across that way. Um, but if you don't accept what's happening with you, then I'd say that you're in sort of like this um, this mind frame of denial. You haven't accepted fully what's happening. And then that's just going to be cause for more things, you know. That's going to be cause for more uh, sort of pain down the track because you're not coming from a place of, um, for me personally, honesty. You've got to be honest about, uh, the you know, the condition that you're in. Uh, you've got to be honest about how your your relationship with that condition. Are you, do you hate being that way? Do you hate the way that you know this condition is making your life? Um, there's there's so much in this to unpack. It's it's a really sort of hard question to answer. Um, but it does come down to learning how to accept, not just straight away accepting. Okay, oh, all right. Buddha said, I'm going to be sick and die. No, it's about it's this process that you do go through of um, understanding yourself and, and knowing that, okay, it's fine. It's just life. Yeah. And I guess from your experience in terms of when you were going through something along those lines, did you, I guess, amongst the acceptance of what your body was going through, did you still go out of your way to seek that assistance in terms of the medical field and navigating, yeah, I guess the health system that we all have access to? Or yeah. what does acceptance, does that mean just sitting in it? So you can still accept what's happening and also still accept help. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm still going through that right now. I've been, I've got a, a really bad back. 
Um, I've been waiting for three years in the medical system here in Perth to get seen to. I still haven't had an appointment. Um, everyone up at Bodignano knows about it, know how, how suffering I've been through with it. And I do get to a point where I have had to accept that this is the way it is. I'm going to be in pain 24 hours a day. It's just the nature of my body. However, it is still okay to sort of have hope that there is going to be some sort of help but also realising that that hope might not be the hope that you think it's going to be. It may, it may not meet that expectation, so just make sure you're not putting it up there. Yeah. Thank you. It's OK. <laughs> Anyone else? No? All right, I'll read some of the ones from online. Oh, this is a good one. I've had COVID recently and I feel sick. I want to meditate, but I don't feel like doing it. What should I do? <laughs> you know what? It was actually when Ajahn Brahm said this many years ago that you know to practice being um, to practice meditation when you have the flu or a cold, and then you know we we always take this medication to suppress the cold and the snot and everything. And I tried this one day. I actually got the flu, and I remember laying in bed really really sick looking at the cold and flu tablets going mm, not today i'll give it a shot and it was actually quite it was really impressive actually because i felt horrible but i sort of let my body do what my body needed to do and i had tons of snot coming out of my nose and i was very very um sort of high fever and feeling quite sorry for myself but then the flu only lasted like two days and this was a bad one. This one really knocked me. Uh, it was two or three days. And I just remember the recovery from it was so much better than you know, taking all these medications for it. Um, so it does work. Now, the other point is, do we practice meditation only when things are going well? When we have the time for it? When we feel motivated for it? Um, or do we try and practice and use those periods in our life where, okay, I've only got 10 minutes. Instead of scrolling through YouTube for 10 minutes, I'll scroll, scroll through my mind for 10 minutes. You know, it's about the choice that you make. So being sick is a wonderful opportunity for you to care for yourself. It's also a good opportunity for other people to care for you. Um, and if other people do show you that care, that's also a good cause for uh, contentment to arise in your mind if you do meditation later you remember you recollect oh that person looked after me that was so nice of them how um, how nice of them to do that for me and that makes you feel good and then you can concentrate better and then you get into deep meditation then you get better <laughs> so if you're sick um, and I've had COVID as well but I didn't get it very bad um, to whoever oh sorry your name is Gloria hi Gloria um, I would say yes, definitely try and do some meditation um, and see how you go with that. How do you deal with anxiety or worry concerning the body and severe pain? Oh, this is another one that I could talk about for hours. So, when we experience a chronic illness, Obviously, the mind and the body are linked together. And uh, obviously, if your body has an issue, if you're in severe pain uh, and that's affecting your daily life and your capability, um, it's going to cause anxiety. It's going to cause you to think in a way where uh, everything surrounding the sensation that you're sort of feeling in that moment uh, becomes negative. You think, I don't want this pain. Uh, why is this happening to me? Uh, what can I do to get rid of this pain? Um, uh, you could be thinking along the lines of, I don't feel good enough because I can't get up and walk as far as my friends do. Or there's all sorts of things that can uh, bring up anxiety or worry concerning your body and severe pain. And the thing is, you have to realize that your whatever your chronic condition is, you can only do what you can do. Um, 
the expectations that others put on you, you can actually say no to, um, which is hard for some people. I mean, I've had to experience that, where you've had to say to people, no, I can't go out and do this. No, I can't go and do that. That's too much for me and my body. And obviously, you know, anxiety would arise as a result of that because then you think, oh, maybe these people don't like me anymore. Maybe they're not my friends. You just go down this massive rabbit hole of negativity before you know it. And so sort of the best way to deal with that is to actually just sit with those thoughts. Um, being present and, uh, you know, having your mindfulness looking at those reactions to things. Uh, looking at the story that you're telling yourself in your head, looking at that narrative and going, why am I sort of choosing to speak this way? Because it's not just a given thing. Um, the narrative in your mind is a conditioned thing like everything else. There is a cause for it. And if you can look back and see that cause for that anxiety, then uh, you can actually deal with it in a very um, gentle, kind way you know, a very patient way, bit by bit, over time. Okay, so this one's talking about, it's from Melissa, um about how it's become normalized to take meditation, oh, sorry, to take meditation. I wish everyone took meditation. Um, so normalized to take medication and get surgeries to reduce pain and discomfort. Okay, so this could be related to both chronic pain and non-chronic pain where our reaction now is we want an instant fix for something when it goes wrong. We live in a, a day and age of um, convenience where things are, you know, not, we don't have to wait long to get um, sort of help or sort of like, you know, we can just go to our doctor to get medication for a headache. Uh, headaches are actually a good one. If you have a headache, actually sit there and meditate with it and try out what I've been talking about tonight instead of reaching for a painkiller. Just give it a go one day and see how it makes you feel. Obviously, if it still hurts later on, you can take, a, take some medication for it. But you learn so much from sitting in there, sitting there with that pain and learning about it um, and sort of retraining yourself not to go for that instant fix of, I'll just take one of those and, and it's done. Um, yeah, it's convenient and you're probably very busy throughout your day, but it's also probably not the best for your body. Um, when it comes to chronic pain, it's a bit different. Chronic pain is more life uh, involving. It involves not just you, but everybody around you, your family, your friends, your work. Um, and so obviously you want to try and be in, in the most capable condition you can be in. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking medication at all. Um, especially for people with chronic pain. But it's also a good thing to learn how to um, sit with these things and learn from them instead of just expecting uh, medication to take away the problem. How do we keep ourselves free from being influenced by the negative which happens even when we are seeking spirituality? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so throughout our day, obviously, there's going to be good things, there's going to be bad things. There's going to be positive things, positive people, and there's going to be negative things and negative people. How do we, as people who are practicing meditation or even you know, being spiritual, uh, how do we stop ourselves from being influenced by those things? I would say that we don't try and stop ourselves from being influenced by those things, but by learning about what influence that has on our minds. Uh, because we can't control what happens outside. We can't control the people we're around. Um, what we can sort of have an influence on is our own minds and how uh, we choose to let things in, uh, how we choose to talk about things, 
uh, like I said before about you know somebody at work saying something or yelling at you at work and then you come to sit down and then you spend the next half an hour hating, absolutely hating that person for what they did. Um, I mean, you wouldn't go to work that to, ne- to work the next day and go and tell that person off because they made you feel unhappy. I mean, you can, but they're probably just going to do it again. What's probably more important is to learn how that's affected you and sort of why has that affected you so much uh, so that you can learn from it because you can spend hours, weeks. People who have been bullied in high school, you know, they take that stuff with them for the rest of their life, uh, all those horrible things people said to them. Um, and there's probably more people they encounter throughout their life uh, that sort of trigger that emotion and that response again. And so you can't stop bullies from, you know, being in the world. We can try. We can discourage it. We can let them know that it's not okay. But also the flip side of that is that we have to sort of um, understand what's happening there from our own point of view, in our own minds, um, how that is affecting us and how that's making us feel. Um, Learning things like forgiveness, even if it's not forgiving that person for what they did, um, but forgiving what's happened for your own uh, healing and your own peace. Um, learning how to let yourself know that you are worthy, uh, letting yourself know that you are capable of being loved. Um, so there's a lot there that we can actually do when we have negative things that happen around us. It's just it's very difficult to have the courage to want to sit with that when it happens everything in our life whether it's good or bad um, it all comes down to how how we look at it how we relate to it your relationship to all these things just like when you sit there and you're practicing meditation with your breath how do you what is your relationship with your breathing uh, what is your relationship with your body uh, and the same thing here is what is your relationship with your thoughts and your emotions especially when it surrounds something like this All right, that's all the questions. Bang on nine o'clock, one more? Yep. Just want to say... um, Hello? That's better. Um, What really helped me after... I used to have headaches, tension headaches as a child. And then after a very bad car accident, I had enormous head injuries, you know, broken all over... Um, I found that I was getting extreme migraines and lots of extreme pain in my body and everything. And then um, through yoga, yoga helped a lot, um, I actually, a friend told me about, um, she said there's a genetic blood group and I think this will help you. So I went on that. I'm a B blood group and I followed that. After a month, my migraine headaches disappeared Mm. My mood swings disappeared. My arthritis disappeared. Um, I, you know, my sort of bad moods disappeared. Um, and my weight stabilised. I used to be very... Um, I had a weight problem, huge weight problem. Now I'm very slim. And I don't, I've never had a headache since yeah. 30 years later. Okay. I'm on no medications. I yeah. gave up all my medications. Yeah. So for people in chronic pain... Diet is an enormous factor. It can help the genetic blood group, whatever, find out what your blood group is and then find out there's stuff on the internet that, you know, eat right for your blood group. But truly, it's been a transformation for me. If I I go and I have to eat, you know, if I go for a dinner for someone and, of course, they've cooked the things that I can't eat, I will still eat them. Um, But the next day, I feel terrible. It, it's an immediate, you know, it drains my energy. I'm, you know, I'm just, yeah. I feel I can barely, you know, want to be alive. Yeah. So diet is enormously helpful. Yeah. Yeah, no medication since I was th- uh, 40 and I'm 75 now and yeah. I feel better than I do than when I was young. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that's good. 
Well, thank you, Matt, for coming and sharing your wisdom, but also your personal experiences and just sharing your knowledge as well. I've uh, definitely felt like I've learnt a lot and it was <laughs> a wonderful talk. <laughs> so, uh, so we would like to finish the night. I think, I think um, three sadhus are definitely <laughs> warranted. So if you'd like to join me. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I thought for those who would like to pay homage to the, um, the Buddha, I thought we'll do three bows and chants. If you, if you know the chanting, please join me. Araham Sama Sambudo Bagawa Buddham Bagawantam Abiwademi Svahato Bagawato Damo Danam Nanasami Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Sangham Nanami. Thank you again, Matt, and have a wonderful night, everyone.